courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another first round of hockey played for the Calgary Flames and another first round exit. I guess the uh, we didn't end up beating the Stars like we thought we might. Matt, maybe my thought that I had before this round that maybe St. Louis would be a better opponent for us wasn't too far off. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, what do you think? Could we beat the, the Blues? We should have beat the Stars too. So, it's true. You know, it's one of those, I think that they would have beat St. Louis. I think they would have should have beat Dallas, but... You know, uh, once again, the Flames got in their own way, and it is what it is. We chatted after uh, Game 4 of the season, so there, or Game 4 of the series. There's been two more games. We won't spend a lot of time on these two games, because I don't think anybody cares to go in-depth. There's been a lot of that over the last couple, couple of days, but let's just look at them. Game 5, uh, the Stars defeat the Flames and take the lead in this round for the first time ever. The Flames win 2-1. to one. Uh, they got goals from Jamie Benn and John Klingberg, and we only got a goal from Michael Backlund. Matt, quick assessment of Game 5. Um, frankly, they came out flat and remained flat. And I don't really... like the, the, That first period was horrendous by the Flames, and they were amazingly lucky to be tied at 1-1 after the first period of play and as soon as dallas got the lead in the third period then magically the flames started to try but that was too far too late this reminded me a lot of the what was it the 2017 2018 and 2018 2019 flames where they would come out and not play for the first period and a half and then like guys we're down let's finally go win this and they'd end up playing great in you know the second and third period I don't think they played great yeah. here, but you saw their game pick up as they as things went on. Yeah, and like if they had played the whole game like they did in the third period, they probably win this game. But I, you know, it's. It, I think that was the theme of all of the Flames' losses. That if they actually played even reasonably consistent, they would have won all of the games that they lost. But they just the takeaway that I have the... written down here for Game Five is it takes sixty minutes of hockey to win in the playoffs. Yeah, and it the Flames played better overall throughout this series than they did against Colorado last year, and yep. I think that even like defensively and like when they weren't because you have to expect the other team is going to push hard at times to assert themselves it doesn't matter if you're playing the best or the worst team they're going to have periods of time where they control things but you have to be able to have the mental fortitude to settle things down and reestablish your game and the flames frankly didn't really do that at any point in game five sadly they didn't and i would say that probably continued into Game Six, where the Calgary Flames ended up losing seven to three. They were up three nothing in the first seven minutes of the game, and somehow they lost seven to three. I remember when I was a kid playing hockey. Our coach used to say, "If you're up by one, you got nothing. If you're up by two, you got insurance. If you're up by three, it's your game to lose." And I think that echoes true here. This was the Flames' game to lose. It is the first time in NHL history that a team has been losing by three goals and winning by four in the same game. And Dallas didn't and, just score seven. They scored seven unanswered. This basically is emblematic of what... Uh, my optimism with this team and the glaring issue with this team. They have... In the first period, they look like the Harlem Globetrotters. And they look like a team that could win the Stanley Cup right now. Here we go. Let's go. They were running all over Dallas completely controlling the play for eight minutes uh, yeah it, pretty much right up until dallas scored their first goal and then the lack of mental fortitude like okay you get scored on big deal still up by two you know like reset yourself and go mm -hmm. but then it's like oh we have to play hockey now oh i uh what huh and 
then ten minutes later, it's seven to, or six to three, and yeah. Yeah, after that first high skin and goal, I saw that too. The Flames seemed like they were on their heels a bit, and I thought they pushed again near the end of the first. But when uh, Gary Anoff scored 59 seconds into the second, it just felt like that was the end. All the gas yeah. was gone, and then uh, and then he scored again at 3:20 five into the second and it's tied like you're like okay now this is where the fun starts but it seems like the flames just went home at that point yeah they, it's like, they mentally oh, well, left the bubble yeah and it is what it is and like this team's mental fortitude was quite apparent and and that's been the thing that's been lacking there's no resolve with the players to buckle down when the going gets tough and like that in game two, when they tied it, if they just buckled down, got to overtime, with the momentum they had, they probably win game two. Mm-hmm. In game four, if they just if Lindholm just eats the puck in the corner, even if he loses it, it's not likely that there's going to be enough time for Dallas to get a shot on net or a good shot on net. You probably win game four. Well, that could have been the series right there if they just had mental fortitude for a little bit of the game like the rest of it like like that's what is holding this team back like the talent is there and like you don't get a 107 point season like they did last year out of nowhere you don't have games like we saw in three and four against winnipeg in game one you don't see the first period like unless you have the skill to do the things that you need to do it's just that it, the problem is entirely in between their ears and they don't have any ability to just breathe for a minute it's like when they make a mistake their hair gets lit on fire they just forget how to play hockey mistakes compound on each other it's like when sam bennett takes gets out of place gets frustrated a bit and takes a penalty you're talking about regular season sam bennett yes not god mode mustache beard not bearded sam bennett mustachio sam bennett yes and you know it but that's emblematic of the whole team especially in the playoffs because i think that one of the problems that they have is that like they want to win and their expectations on themselves are so high, I think that they're getting in their own way because they're trying to make the perfect plays. And it's like Gaudreau's line is, throughout the playoffs, was being too fancy instead of just doing the simple plays and getting pucks on net and then going through the chaos. They were trying to make the really pretty nice plays, and sometimes you don't need that. You just need to get chances on net and see what happens. Yeah, I think to me, like you're right, the team doesn't have the mental fortitude. We've seen that this season. We saw that last season. And it's not just one set of guys. Like it seems when one set of guys gets down, it spreads the whole team. It's like worse than this virus that we're going through. It's contagious to the whole team. You know, you get one line who maybe plays bad or lets in a bad goal and the whole team just goes down. So it's not like you can bench one set of guys and play the rest. I don't know, Matt. I I don't know what's wrong. I mean, we'll try to figure out what's wrong as we go. But overall, I guess if I had to give my – you you summed up game six, but I think if I look at the overall playoffs, based on what we saw from the team this year, this is about what I expected. Yeah. Like these weren't great Calgary Flames. They were battling to be in eighth spot at some point in the season. This is kind of what I expected based on the season that we got. Yeah, and, like, it's frustrating because just based off of talent, they should be better than what they were this season. Mm-hmm. But but you could say the same thing last season, too, right? They won the West, and they crapped out in the first round. Like, that's kind of the, the story of the last decade of the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and uh, that's where, like, certain changes need to be made, and I think that... Uh, a letter has to be removed from a certain player's jersey and put on another player. Let's talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. 
We'll talk, we'll talk about changes we need to make, but let's work our way there. Any overall expect or any overall sort of playoff thoughts from you? Well, I do have to give credit to Dallas. Their defense is really good. And, like, they did nearly beat the Dal- uh, St. Louis Blues last year in the postseason and all of that. Like, you know, it's not like they played some loser team that and fell to them. It, like, that Dallas the is before. a good yeah um it's one of those things that the flames if you play that series again it, it, with the same parameters the flames easily could have won, won that one the bounces didn't go their way at times and it happens and i think that this team like they need to make changes but I don't think that they need to make a huge amount of changes. Because at times you've called for blowing this team up and oh, I'm. Uh, how would you say I'm? Like it. It's like with Dougie Hamilton. Like I like Dougie Hamilton. I think he's a good defenseman. But a right deal came around involving him that made sense for the team, and like. Say with Johnny Gaudreau. I like him. I like having him on the team. He's a good player. If the right trade comes about, fine, great. You know, but it has to make sense. Sort of like the Matt Duchesne trade with Colorado. It just has to make sense. Not just a, oh, well, we need to trade Gaudreau just to trade Gaudreau. And, you know, and I, like, I, at, I'm a fan as well, so you you know your instinct is like, oh, like Monahan's line didn't do much, Gaudreau's line, Gaudreau didn't do very much, so like let's just go play Xbox and let you know switch the you know make the fancy trades with like say the Florida Panthers to get Bark off or over something override like that. the AI and do you know just get rid of your guys. Yeah, and you know it. It's, of course, like, that's, like, the natural reaction. Cause well, again, let's keep some of the thoughts about moving players for a little bit later. But any other thoughts on sort of the playoffs that we just finished? Uh, disappointing. I think they could have gone further, but, you know, it is what it is. And we'll see how good Dallas matches up against Colorado. They did win game one. And I like I think if they beat the Avalanche, that'll take a lot of the sting off of uh, losing to them. But um, yeah, I, I think that the Flames would have been hard pressed to beat Vegas. I, I think they yeah, pretty we much would have last week. I, I think they pretty much would have had a similar result to what Vancouver did in Game One. <laughs> so we'll see. Let's talk about the end of season garbage bag days. We know every season the players come back and clean out their their lockers, and uh, they call it garbage bag day because they put their stuff in a garbage bag and take off. Who knows who's going how far this year? But um, it was virtual garbage bag this day. All the players, the coach, and the GM talked to the media um, via Zoom and more digital than at the dome this year. And we learned some things that we probably knew. Um, Kachuk was out because he sustained a concussion in Game Two against Dallas. Doesn't surprise me. I didn't know it was a. I didn't know that it was a concussion. But Maddie's a fighter, and you know that if he was out for a while like he was, it was something bad. So hopefully, with a long off season, he'll be able to fix that. Uh, Rasmus Anderson played through a broken foot, and this one surprises me. Like Anderson was, I think, one of the best Flames in that series. And if he didn't have a broken foot, Matt, think about how much better he could have been. Yeah, well, I actually thought he took a lot of strides to becoming a top-pairing defenseman in I that agree. series. And I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't a top-pairing defenseman next year. Yeah. And th- doing all that while having a broken foot, like, that's pretty damn impressive. Well, that's it. For the Blue Liners, I think he was probably the, the one that you would say made the most strides in that series. And to do it, you know, with a broken foot, I mean, you know, yeah, it's it shows his level of compete and what he can still do playing through that pain and talking about pain. Sam Bennett also played with a torn tricep. I think he also got that in uh, game two. So 
explains his lack of faceoffs. Probably the reason Lucic was taking faceoffs later as well. And even Bennett. I mean, we've talked about him before. You mentioned his God mode earlier. Always a great playoff performer, and he didn't look like a guy who had a torn tricep either. No, and I really, really would like for the next coach, whether it's Ward or whomever, to give Sam Bennett a lot of runway as a center next season with good line mates and see what he can actually do. Because there are guys that do actually break out when they hit 23-24, and he looks more comfortable than I think I've seen him since he was 18-year-old Sam Bennett. And I think we found good line mates for him now. Yeah, and like even if you were to bump him up a line and say like put Kachuk with uh, Bennett and Dubé, like I think that would be a fairly good second line. So you know, like it's there are options, but I think that it makes things a lot easier because you don't need to go get another top nine center if Bennett can play. You know, because like you already have it in house, so that would be awesome. Yeah, and anytime you have center depth, it's always um, it, it always makes your job a little bit easier as a GM. Yeah, especially like if you have like uh, Backland, Ryan, uh, Lindholm, Monahan, Bennett, Dubé, who can all throw up the middle if need be. Like that's a very good problem to have. So that was what we learned today from Garbage Bay Day. Um, two players injured. I guess I'd say more temporary, one longer term. Hopefully a, a concussion of Kachuk isn't going to stall his career. We see some guys who, you know, they end up getting a concussion at some point, and it just it really starts that down that downslide for them. And I'm hoping that's not where Kachuk is at. And the fact that he will, uh, I, I guess the fact that he's probably going to get a, a bunch of rest now tells me that he'll probably be okay. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, it's always worrying, but... You know, just have to wait and see, basically. Matty, you ready to get in our time machine and go back before COVID-19 to September 30th, 2019? When the world actually made sense? Sure. I need one of those harp sounds, like from 80s um, sitcoms when they, you know, flash back yeah. and everything gets the ripply look on it. Yeah. We're going to go back to just before the season opened when you and I did our annual uh, season predictions. And we generally predict pretty much the same things, a couple new things every year. Ready to see how we did? Yeah. By the way, usually when we get the wavy lines, it's just one of us is lagging. <laughs> That's right. But then the people listening don't get to hear the harp sound effect, like in a sitcom. No. True. Um, first question, who will have a breakout season? You and I both said Sam Bennett, but I said probably Milan Lucic because I, be, uh, I wanted to pick somebody different. And I think we could probably say that Lucic, I wouldn't say had a breakout season, but I think he outperformed expectations. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think that he played, as the season went on, even better. And I think that uh, he had an excellent playoff. And I think that Sam Bennett had an excellent playoff. So. I agree. I wouldn't call either one of them a breakout season for those guys, though. No. But uh, better than, well, especially with Bennett's playoff, better than expected. Yeah. result anyway like i don't think sam bennett's regular season was great but then when once he was put in a position to succeed he did yeah that's a good point uh next question who will struggle this season i said i thought andrew mangiapani and he looked pretty solid all season i mean he ended the season on the second line and you thought mark jankowski so i think we'll give you that one yeah, well, I don't think that Jankowski will even be back next year. Well, so. and the guy who loses his playoff roster spot to Zach Ronaldo probably tells you that, yeah, you're struggling, buddy. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah which I is unfortunate, but, you know, that's life, unfortunately. Like, sometimes players just don't have that extra gear in them, and you just have to go with somebody else. The next question I asked to both of us, will both goaltenders be able to stay healthy? As we remember the past couple seasons, Riddick's got hurt at various points, and uh, we've had to either play Smith or remember the end, what was it, two seasons ago when he got hurt and they brought up Gillies because they needed a second body. And I would say, yeah, I mean, both guys got bumps and bruises here, but they both stayed healthy for the most part. 
Yeah, it, and that was a good thing for... There was no extended injury to any goalie, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, the next question we asked, how many starts for Talbot? Matt, you thought that Talbot would get 40 starts this year. I thought 35 to 40. He started 22 games. So, yeah. didn't get the workload that we probably thought he would. No, but uh, he did play strong in the postseason, and I think that he's going to be the de facto starter next season. Unless yeah, I, the Flames go and like sign Braden Holtby or something like that. Yeah, we'll talk about that later in the show. We've only got so much money, so we got to decide where we want to sign. Um, who will be the first call-up? This is one I always find to be interesting every year. We both pick a forward and a defenseman. Do you remember your picks here? Oh, I think Yellison was the defenseman. You picked Shillington for your defenseman and oh. Dubé for your forward. I picked Quine for my forward and Shillington for my defenseman. So we tied defense. Uh, Quine got called up October 20th and Dubé not till December 17th. So I guess I you beat won you. won that one. Yeah, I beat you on that one by less than a Couple month. Couple weeks, yeah. First guy traded this season. I thought Mark Jankowski, you correctly predicted Michael Froelich. If people remember, Froelich was... I had to double-check this. I'm like, was Froelich a member of the Flames this year? Yeah, yeah. he was. Um, he got traded January 2nd to the Buffalo Sabres in exchange for a fourth-round pick in this year's entry draft. And we know what the Flames were able to do with fourth-round picks. So I'm, I'm uh, expecting that's going to become our next great player. Didn't we trade that for Gustafson? Could be. I didn't yeah. look that far. Yeah. But even or, or no, I think we trade our pick for Gustafson. I yeah. don't know, I'll check. I just remember the, a fourth going generally. I can't well, remember which. Let me check. I think I have it here. Uh, round four, 2022. Yeah, you're right. We did. We have our fourth this year. So so I guess Michael for a leak for a rental of Gustafson? Yeah, okay. Works for me. What do the Flames need to be successful this season? You have answered the same three things for the last three seasons. Stanley Cup or bust? So, epic fail according to September, Matt? Yeah, well, it, it was. So, I, and, you know. And I wasn't as optimistic. I said at least the Western Conference Finals. So, epic fail for me as well. Yeah, well, it, it was a disappointing season. So, it is what it is. The next question we can't fully answer, where will the Flames finish in the regular season in the Pacific? You, I said second, you said first. We don't really know because we didn't finish the season. Um, I yeah. think they were actually third when we shut it down, weren't they? Um, yeah, Vegas and Edmonton were ahead of us. Yeah, and Vancouver. So. Actually, fourth. Okay, so we didn't win that yeah. one either. No. Next question. Yeah. Will Kachuk's performance match his pay as the top paid flame this year? We both said yes. I would say uh, that we both got that one. I think that he yeah. he was probably the best flame for most games this year. Yep. Uh, I agree. I think that – and I think that has more to do with the regression from the first line than – more a little more so than the, reg uh, the progression from Kachuk, but he did assert himself a lot more. We talked about this earlier. Unexpected playoff hero. I said Bennett. You said Lucic. I think we'll both get a point for that one. Yeah. It, there was two guys that really stood out. One and one. There you go. So, yeah, we were bang on on that one. When we looked ahead in our crystal ball, why didn't we see this COVID thing? It, it was a little cloudy, I guess. I guess so. Regular season points. I thought we'd finish with 115. You thought 121. Do you remember what number we actually finished with? It was like 80-something, I think. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that, yeah, it was a bad season. And how far can the Flames go in the playoffs? Again, you said Stanley Cup. I said if they're lucky, they'll lose in the Western Conference Finals. So, yep. uh, it's if you look back, I was looking back at all the years that we've done this, It's we always shoot high and end up being disappointed. Well, this is the fun part, Matt. Now we get to talk about what we're going to change. And you were looking at this earlier, trying to, you know, make some some changes to coaches and players and this sort of thing you were mentioning earlier. Let's go through this piece by piece, just so we can talk about one sort of change or potential change, and then move on to the next. Does that work for you? Sure. Why not? Before we get to this, let's just remember it's been a weird year for the Flames. We fired a coach. 
We had TJ Brody collapse on the ice. Like there's a lot that's been going on with this team. And I think I'm not trying to make excuses, but it's easy to, to sort of forget some of those things. So I think as we're as fans reminiscing on the season, we need to remember some of those things that happened. And with well, that, this season's been a long decade. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's it. The big pause in the in the I wouldn't say the middle of the season, but at the end of the season, um, it's just it's been a weird one. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the coach, uh, interim head coach Jeff Jeff Ward took over after uh, Bill Peters got fired mid year. We all remember the again something that happened with this team, the racism story that came out. We won't dig into that now. Matt, do you think that interim head coach Jeff Ward will lose the interim tag and be back behind the Flames bench as head coach next year? Uh, I, it's one of those things. I don't think they should, but that would also be totally the Calgary Flames way of doing things. And I don't think he's the best coach. I don't think he's the right coach, but he's cheap. And I think that the Flames ownership is not willing to spend on getting a proper coach. They just spent a whole ton of money on a new rink. They've obviously lost some revenues this year. But looking back at this team, when have we ever gone with the, you know, the top end elite, you know, expensive guy? I mean, Pierre Paget, Brian Sutter, Don Hay, Greg Gilbert, Daryl Sutter, Playfair, Aluminum Mike Keenan, Brent Sutter, Bob Hartley, Glenn Gullitson, Bill Peters. We've never really gone with the high end coaches. This team, you know, likes the I, I think that. What the Flames should do is go with another GG goalie and get Gerard Gallant. And Gallant would be a good one. You know, him, Laviolette, even Daryl Sutter. Like, they need a name guy who knows how to actually coach a team to success and has been successful. And, like... Yeah, like, the Flames have had a couple of coaches like that in the past, like Mike Keenan, but, like, it was, like, 15 years after well, he actually it. won even, the even Cup. Even a guy like Bob Hartley won a Cup, and we didn't get him right after. We got him, like, 10 years later. Yeah, and it's, like, well, like, Gallant was just in the Stanley Cup Finals, like, two seasons ago, and... I like both Laviolette and Gallant as an option. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sutter won a couple of Cups recently. Well, Daryl's um, retired. Well, not necessarily. No coach is truly I, retired. I don't. I know you like Daryl, and you've. You, we have our whole episode where you pretty much went off the whole show on hiring Daryl. I think right now, if you're looking for a higher end coach, there's a there's. Oh yeah, know, a lot of other sure. guys I'd go like, with. I Gallant think would I think be my number one. From a PR perspective, Daryl just seems like the retread. We couldn't find anybody else, so we called Daryl. Yeah. Um, I think that Jeff Ward will get yeah. an interview for the head job. I think he. I think management, I mean, he was one of the guys they interviewed and was in the running when they hired uh, Gullitson. I think he'll get an interview, but I agree with you. I think if they want to go cheap, Ward's your guy. But I think that uh, Gerard Gallant is the guy that I'd be targeting. Yeah, because it's basically it gets to the point of, well, do you actually want to win uh, Stanley Cup? And, or are you just playing around? And, like, are you serious? And, to me, the Flames have never, like, since Daryl Sutter was the coach back in 04, I don't feel that the Flames have ever actually been serious about winning. No, I agree. And I, and I think that you see that in the results, where they just, they're there. And they're just cannon fodder. Like, there's no difference between us and, like, the Minnesota Wild or any of the other mediocre teams that just are constantly just okay and around the playoffs but never actually do anything if they get there. And, you know, like, the Flames, if they have the talent where they should be more successful and have been more successful, but they just can't translate it and that's where you need a good leadership group and that starts with the coach and the coach needs if the coach has never actually won or led a team 
deep into the playoffs, how is he supposed to know what you need to actually do to it's get the there? It's the blind leading the blind. It's you know yeah. like bringing McDavid in, giving him the captaincy, and saying, "All right, take us to the cup." Yeah, in your and, first year. Yeah, exactly. And like the Flames have a group where they could win the cup. Like I still believe in this team because they have the talent, but it comes you know like when the flames were running around against the stars and like in panic mode against dallas i recall back like when chicago was winning their cups and you'd have guys like keith and taves and kane just on the bench yelling at the guys just calm down reset yourself and like they'd lead by example on the next shift and just play a calm shift and it would reset and like they'd just start rolling again and go and but this team doesn't have any of those stabilizing factors except for Matthew Kachuk he's been the only guy that I've seen that has that leadership everybody else it that's why like things tend to snowball with this team like when Dallas tied it in game six like if this was a Chicago type team you would have had everybody saying, okay, who cares? We're tied. Let's just buckle down and go back to work. And yet that didn't happen. And three more goals in the next couple of minutes and the game and season's over. I think you can't just change the coach hoping it's going to change the entire, I mean, fortunes. We've seen, what, four coaches in five years now. But And if I were head coach, I might be leery to come here because of that. But I think the Flames need to get somebody they're willing to stand behind for three, four years. And if they don't want to spend yeah, money or be in a bidding war for a gallant, I would say even get somebody who's fresh out of a job. Like I could see a Bob Bugner or a Jim Montgomery or John Hines. They're not my first pick, but they're guys that have some experience with the NHL and I think are, you know, guys that could peak with the right team. Yeah. It, it's just... But I think, I, I think as a head coach, you don't want to come here if you think you're going to be here for a year. Yeah, and I think that's where like the Flames need to now address... like How, how do you say Last year, when the tires fell off the wagon, they addressed a little bit of the leadership in the room. And like you saw Lucic being brought in. And more emphasis on guys like Kachuk. I think that the Flames now moving forward with transactions need to get more guys that are winner types or have that right mindset in addition to the coach and like have everybody buying into the system and guys that are going to hold each other accountable instead of well, when we talked about it last week, I don't think it's a coaching problem. Like, no. You know, we've gone through how many coaches no. now with the same core. I agree. And I think it's one of those where it's a little bit of A, B, C, and D. And I think you have to make a little bit of changes in A, B, C, and D. And I think that, like, you look at guys like Monaghan and Gaudreau and Giordano, and they're all very nice people. And that's great. Like, you know, they're pleasant to talk to you know Giordano is one of the more gentlemanly people in the league but we're not here to win a popularity contest though exactly and for lack of a better word you need guys like Kachuk who are a bit of an a-hole in order to be successful and like you look at Boston when they won the cup and have been to the finals a few other times well Brad Marchand Lucic when he was there like those guys are total dirt bags and you need that and i think that we're still talking about the coach though right you're not no gonna i bring know in a dirt bag coach i think the way to say it maybe is you need a guy who knows how to push different players some yeah. guys need to be pushed by giving them a certain talking to some guys need to be pushed by riding the pine i mean do you remember the year that um who was it hartley sat johnny for like three games yeah you know, and you need someone who's not afraid to do that. And I think one of the things I saw with um, with our interim head coach, Jeff Ward, that I would, wasn't quite happy with is he did what so many other coaches here have done is they just rode that first line, whether it was effective or not. 
he just rode those three and he wasn't willing to change it up. And I think even in game six and game five, we saw some of that too. Yeah. And like, frankly, like moving forward, I would not want to see those three on the same line if they're in the organization still. Uh, like I, I think that you need to split them up in order. And it's, you saw similar things in Chicago when they broke up Kane and Taves, like you, you need to, I think, spread the wealth a little bit. And I think the flames could, with the personnel they have, have three scoring lines legitimately. Yeah, I and I think that they need to make an addition to the team in order to f enable that. But I think that that's where they need to go, where you have three legitimate scoring lines and that you can roll one after another and just wear the other team down. Another part of this coaching question, I think, we have to look at our coaching staff. I mean, Marty Jelena, like you were saying earlier, a nice man, nice guy to talk to. Not sure he's the guy you want as your assistant coach. And if we're going to bring in a top head coach like a Gerard Gallant, you need to let him bring his own people. And how often have we seen it in Calgary history where a GM comes in and they're saddled with our existing coaching staff? Like, I think you need to be willing to say to the new guy, you can fire in, you can let go of any of them you don't want. Don't want Siglet, don't want uh, Ray Edwards. Like I think we we have to I'm not saying fire them all, but I think you need to give the coach the leash to be able to do that. Yeah, I agree. And whoever that coach is. I mean, you know, Marty's a nice guy, but there's other things you can do around here besides coach. Yeah, and I think that the team just needs to reset its identity a bit. Well, with that, let's talk about another guy who uh, helps set this team identity, and that's the man upstairs, the man who during the playoffs didn't seem to know he needed his mask over his nose in every shot that we saw of him, Brad Treliving. Treliving's contract extension just kicked in. Uh, he's managed to get the Flames into the playoffs in three of the last four seasons and four of the past six. The team is in a better spot now than when he took over in 2014. Do you think it's time to say goodbye to Treliving? Absolutely not. He. This would be the stupidest single stupidest thing that the team could do is fire Brad. He signed great contracts he's put the right players on the ice well not only he's that done his job. he when the flames have had problems he's correctly identified those problems and taken steps to address them because he goes through the process exactly and when is the last time calgary had a general manager who had that level of competence like i think you have to go all the way back to fletcher frankly and you know like the flames are in a they lucked out in my opinion getting a guy like Treliving as their general manager and like the flames drafting has been impressive considering the lack of high-end picks well let's go through the uh let's go through the gms and you can tell me competent or not competent the first one cliff fletcher obviously uh, you know awesome general manager D doug risebrow uh i don't even have to answer that <laughs> al coates adequate for his job but not good craig button um yeah there's a reason he's the tsn analyst these days yeah daryl sutter love him as a coach uh yeah and that's he adequate it it i think he was mandated to try to win and his decisions were rushed. He was doing okay at the beginning, and by the end he seemed to have gone like off his rocker when he started bringing in some weird guys near the Alish end. Alish Kotalik, anyone? Exactly. Uh, after him was Jay Feaster. Good at drafting. Brian Burke? Uh, not so good at drafting. <laughs> and Brad Treliving. Uh, yeah, uh, the best ones. So good at trading draft picks. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that it would be a foolish move to move Tree. I think he's probably got to be more on the owner's radar than maybe he was before, but uh, he's done everything he can. And like you said, he makes the changes. He makes good trades. He's been a wizard at signing great contracts. I mean, even if you look at, you know, like the Lindholm deal, what a fantastic deal for this team. It would be a, a real disappointment to lose him. Yeah, and like the Flames drafting has been excellent. Uh, like even just for guys that they've dealt like fox that was a good pick and you know we ended up getting a top four defenseman and a top line forward in that trade and 
you know, if Fox wasn't as good as he is, that trade doesn't happen. So, you know, it's... Well, and you you know you mentioned the Hamilton deal earlier, and I know Tree got some flack for acquiring a guy and then moving the guy out the next year, but we still got value in moving him out. Yeah, like you know Tree's not. I don't think we've seen Tree as we do with a lot of GMs bring a guy in and be so fixed on this is my guy, I'm never going to move him. Yeah, it, it's does it make sense? And I think that just that rationality, you know, it's like if the Flames. Sit, Say a trade was made, offer was made for even Matthew Kachuk, but it made sense to do it in terms you of... You Tree would do the deal. Uh, you would. It, it It's one of those things, like, if you're getting, like, pillaging the other team for a player, well, fine. You know, and, like, the Flames pillaged the Hurricanes, frankly, in that trade, and... You know, because, like, we weren't going to have Fox or Furland after that season, so, you know, like, to me, like, those were both non-assets. So, to me, it was, you know, just Dougie Hamilton for those two, and so, you know. The thing that most encourages me about Tree still is anytime you hear discussion of GMs, you hear Tree was on the phone with so-and-so, Tree was calling around, like, I think he's one of the GMs that has the, his pulse in the league, and he always it seems to know who's going to move or what teams want. And he can't always do the deal, but he's got that sense of what's going on. Yeah, and he's always trying to make the team better. Like, we saw the nearly completed uh, Brody for Kadri deal. Um, the Flames uh, attempting to get, like, Marc-Andre Fleury and Ben Bishop in the past. Well, even this year, there's apparently a Taylor Hall deal that was almost done. Yeah, and it's uh, even uh, the Stone trade last year at the deadline like the flames were the favorite for that as well and pro league for zucker yeah so like you can go down the list like there was a lot of things that where like the flames were trying to make the good deal to improve the team none of them came to fruition but at least they were there and the deals that were breaking made sense you know, from the Flames' point of view, it wasn't like, oh, well, we're gonna, we were close to trading uh, Johnny Gaudreau for some random third line guy and a, a fifth defenseman. You know, Johnny Gaudreau for his brother out of the Islanders, wherever he is these days. Yeah, like just yeah, like the, you're not seeing any like. Uh, I hope that deal doesn't come down. <laughs> Gaudreau for Derek Grant and Tyler Pitlick. Hey, we're not Edmonton. <laughs> and a fifth that'll make it oh fair. yes that would be an oilers deal get that fifth in there and then use that pick so, for, GM, for nothing but <laughs> well we can trade it for i mean if we can get gustafson for a four think of what we can get for a fifth true um we're gonna keep the gm we're gonna look at a new coach let's move on you mentioned earlier about changing letters so let's talk about i imagine you're talking about the c the captain c with number five um do you think it's time to change captains? Yep. I think I think the team's identity needs to change. And I think that Mark Giordano is very much a gentleman's player. And, you know, I like his leadership. I think he provides a lot of on-ice leadership in terms of leading by example. But... I think that the team needs to go in the more in the direction of the type of leadership that Matthew Kachuk brings. And I think that, like, that vocal, like, in-your-face, like, rah-rah, let's-go attitude, where, like, he's chatting at the players and, like, trying to get them motivated and, like, let's-go and all that. I think that that's more of what the type of personality from the captain that the Flames need right now than the more professionally sound, you know, and polite version in Giordano. So let's let me ask you another question related to the captain then. Do you think it's time to move Mark Giordano off this roster? If the trade makes sense, sure. Okay, are you shopping him? Let's put that... Of course, if a trade makes sense, you're going to take it, but are you out trying to move this guy? 
I think that at this point, after, like, how the last handful of playoffs have gone, um, I think there's maybe six players on the team that you don't shop actively, and I think everybody else is available and being shopped. And I think that, like, if the deal makes sense... It, it's one of those things. It's not, I'm desperate to get rid of Giordano. It's, hey, he's available. This is what I would like, generally. And I guess that's kind of one of my, my shopping number. You're trying to get rid of him and be willing to, let's say, take a loss to get no. rid of the guy. And there's not a single player on the Flames that I'd be willing to take a loss on. Just to get rid of him. James Neal? I know what you're I would. But, you know, like... The, yeah, uh, well, yeah, and, and there's always a few, but, yeah, I think we made that big deal last year. Yeah, and, like, I don't see the onus on, like, dumping Goudreau or dumping Monaghan or dumping Giordano or whomever else. It's, if the... You're de- looking for hockey deals. Yeah, like, if the deal makes sense where you're getting, you know, like, say, like, uh, a team like Colorado wants Giordano to be like the teacher for Makar well that's fine give us a couple of good good assets for that and we'll talk but you know do you go out of your way just to oh well we're gifting you to team x no I don't think so and it would have to make sense in terms of get in, specifically with Giordano, if you're getting players that more fit the age group with the team, then... Yeah. I know what you're saying about moving moving on from him as captain. I don't necessarily agree. I think that Kachuk is definitely the next captain, but I don't know if I would make that change yet. Do you remember when um, Conroy gave his C to, to Jerome McGinley? Mm-hmm. I think that's what has to happen. I think it's Geo's to either give away or retire slash leave the team with and then Kachuk gets it. If Gio thinks it's time to make that change, I would be okay with that, but I don't want the, the GM or the coach to strip number five and put it on number nineteen. We have a long time with Kachuk and I think that I, I just think that it's uh, it wouldn't be a classy move to make. I can I can see I can see where you're coming from. You know and and you don't I mean we even saw in the playoffs just because you're not not wearing a C doesn't mean you can't be a leader and help shape who the team was we saw Lucic do it we saw Kachuk do it like I think that we need leadership throughout the lineup and I don't know you need to wear the C to do that true the other thing too is the captain's the one who's supposed to be interacting with the officials and arguing things I think you're gonna have a better chance of being heard with Gio as your captain than with Kachuk as your captain not necessarily I well, I think that if he's the guy who's just in the corner, maybe throwing a butt end into somebody, and then he's trying to tell the ref, uh, ref, you're not calling it fairly. I, I don't know if that's if you're going to necessarily be heard by the officials well, that way. Well, isn't uh, the leadership award uh, named after Mark Messier, who was perhaps like the dirtiest player in the NHL well, in the last at, forty years at points <laughs> of his career. It, it, it's one of those things that I think that a lot of that's overblown. I've I've argued this with a lot of uh, people this week who've said the same thing as you. I think Matt's dad was more effective as an assistant than as a captain. I think there's things you can get away with not being the captain as well that you can't necessarily if you're wearing the C. And I think his dad was more effective as an A for that reason. Yeah, I can see that. You know, I, I, I don't disagree he's a great leader here. I'm just not sure at 22 he's the guy I want to be my captain. I think he's going to be the next captain, but I'm not sure I put him there yet. And as far as moving on from Gio, I don't think we can look at Gio as our number one defenseman next year, but I think he's he's got two years left after this. At least keep him for 2021 and decide what to do with him in the expansion draft. But I think Gio's a, a great veteran. He always makes guys he plays with look better. And I think with a very young defensive core, he's the kind of guy you want to keep around here. Yep. Well, with that, you got into some changes that need to be made earlier. Let's talk about some other guys that we might want to move out of here. Now, of course, we're not going to say if, if there's a deal that makes sense, we'll do it. Obviously, that's true. So if we're thinking of moving a guy, let's try to come up with what that deal might look like to get that done. Um, top line, Johnny, Monty, and Lindholm. A lot of criticism for those guys. Do you think that uh, – what do you think we should do with those three? Do you think they should be back next year? Can you think of any deals you might want to do there? What type of player you, you might want to get for those guys? 
Um, honestly, I would like to keep, and I'll just uh, say this, that my first preference is basically all of the key forwards in the top uh, nine. I think that the Flames should keep all of them. So it, I think that they just need to add some more and maybe switch up the pairings on the lines themselves. Okay, but, so, um, so I know you've talked about bringing in Taylor Hall. Who do you move out to yeah. get that kind of cap room then? Let's assume he's making 9 or 10 if he comes uh, in. Uh, I would just uh, let Hamannick and Brody walk and just use their cap And then cap backfill on him. the defense with in internal yeah. options? Internal options, cheaper options. Okay. Uh, like one-year vet deals for veterans. Because okay, you're pretty much going to need all of their cap room between those two if we're going to do that. Yeah, well, I'd, I'm not expecting the goalies to be making that much, and uh, I'm expecting... Well, we're not re-signing Riddick, so we probably get, uh, what, Talbot for another million, so let's call it 3-5 for him? Yeah, and I think that, like, if you look at the top four for the defense, um, like, I would expect Valimaki to probably work his way in there. I'd bring Gustafson back, and I don't think he'd be very much so you've money. you've got what, uh, like Giordano, one... Hannafin, Anderson, Gustafson is your top four to start with? Uh, Valimaki instead of Gus. Okay, so Gustafson's on your 5-6 with somebody in Shillington. Toronto. Okay. Shillington. Uh, there you go. And, like, Michael Stone or miscellaneous seventh defenseman. Oh, yeah, Michael Stone's you still know. here. Yeah, insert name of veteran guy here basically any yeah oh that's right we're talking about a weird season to... we paid michael stone to go away in the off season and paid him to come back i forgot about that yeah yeah it it seems literally like five years ago yeah we we <laughs> bought him out of like a 3.5 million dollar deal and then paid him to come back yeah uh, it, this whole year has just been the strangest period uh, i think in all of our lives like it it's just yeah. I've said this on our show for a couple of years. I think Sean Monahan is a fine center. I don't think he's a fine number one center. I think Monty is your number two guy on a good team. And yeah. I, I think even if you're looking at moving Johnny, you, ha yeah. you have to treat them both as getting sort of second line value back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, like, I, how would you say, like, uh, I think that, like, the upper end value of uh, Gaudreau would probably be, like, a Travis Sandheim with, like, Brink and maybe a second-round pick. Interesting. You know, which, uh, like, a basically a number four defenseman with potential, a former late first-round pick, and a second-round pick. Like, I, you know, it's... See, and the guy I was looking at there is I think, okay, next year, Kachuk has to be our number one left-winger. Yeah. So Johnny's going to be number two. We're short on centers and we're short on the right. I bet you could do Johnny and something for Travis Konechny. I don't think that Philly would want to trade him, though. Uh, after and these playoffs, probably not. Before this, maybe. Yeah. It, it's one of those things that I... Th what I would ideally like to see... I'm going to just add like Taylor Hall as like one create three scoring lines. Does Hall and become have your Taylor first Hall. line center? Uh no. Um I would have all of Kachuk, Gaudreau, and Hall on the left wing. Okay. First, second and third line. And I actually would demote Gaudreau technically down to the it's third expensive line. Expensive third line left wing. But I would be doing things a little bizarrely. I I would like to see Gaudreau with Bennett and Dubé because I think that stylistically Gaudreau needs players that can muck around a bit yet be creative enough to both play make and score off of his chances. And I really liked the combination of Bennett and Dubé in the playoffs, and I think that those three would make a, a heck of a line. And I, I would uh, put Hall 
uh, with Monahan and Lindholm, and keep uh, Kachuk with Backlund and Manjapani, and basically have them all labeled as the first line, because they basically all would be. Yeah, the only thing I don't like about that then is, I mean, you've got you're paying a lot of guys. I mean, that essentially moves Luch to your fourth line. That's very expensive. And I think we then get into a defensive core that might be too young if we're not going to replace those guys. And that's fine. Sure. I think that at, at this point, frankly, I think Hannafin and Anderson need more responsibility and more minutes. Mm-hmm. And I think that they need to be the first pairing next year anyway, regardless of any move that happens. I think that needs to be pairing number one, which would move Giordano to the second pair. And really, you're talking the four, five, six guys. And, like, we already have two pretty good depth defensemen in Shillington and Valimaki who would easily fall in the four, five range anyway. So... Like, yeah, it would be a young defense, but I think that, like, with a healthy Valimaki, I don't see, like, it, there being this massive fall-off that, and it's not like the defense was particularly a strength of the team in the first place. No, but uh, to me, and again, we both have different ways we would do this, so I'm not going to say yours is right or wrong, but to me, I think that it's a younger defense than I would want. And, you know, we're talking about needing veterans for the playoffs, and I think that's going to be the case on the blue line as well. So, Yeah, and I think that that's where you could backfill at the deadline. Could be, yeah. I mean, again, I would take a different approach, but I see where you're coming from. I personally don't want them to spend the money it's going to take to get Hall. I don't think Hall's the right guy to fill this team. We've never... Hall doesn't have playoff experience. We've heard things about Hall in the dressing room that maybe he's not the guy that, um, you know, that we would want there. I know where you're coming from, but I wouldn't go out and get Taylor Hall. I think I would try to, I think there's going to be a lot of players that need to move this year. And I think I would try my hand either trying to make a hockey deal or um, at the try, trying to pick guys up as a free agent. Yeah, well... Um, the thing is, is that, uh, with going, like, all in on the forward group, mm-hmm. um, I think that, like, the, there's a specific reason why I think that might be the best way of going about it, okay. and it's because of the fact that Monaghan and Gaudreau have two years left on their contracts, and... See, and I think they're more valuable now because of that, because we're in a flat cap era, and teams are going to want good deals, and both those guys are on a good deal. I think you can trade them for more. Oh, I know, and that's why, yeah, and I agree, actually, and that's why, like, that, that's, like, if you can't get, like, a good hockey deal for either of those guys, then, you know, go with, like, what I was saying with getting Hall and, like, just over stacking the whole forward group if you can get those really good deals like look at like how much the flames paid for hamannick right Mm -hmm. relative to what hamannick was just because he was cheap enough to fit in the cap if you can get a similar overpayment by another team for gaudreau and monahan then be my guest you know like uh, it, it with how the season ha- last year and this year ended like there's not really that like oh we're married to the guy like we were with Aginla or Kiprasov like the flames fell so hard on their face last year they felt failed to meet expectations of responding so well let me just finish kind of where I was going yeah. with this Okay, we, we yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. We, we yeah. heard your lineup. Let me at least get my yeah. lineup out first. So if it was me, I would, I think that we're going to see some centers moved out of Pittsburgh. I think Crosby and or yeah. Malkin leaves this year. Um, I, I think that's one team, or I think that a team like Columbus is going to need some center help. Uh, Minnesota might need some center help. So I would actually do a deal like uh, Monahan for Zucker and something, maybe a pick. I think Zucker's not a top line guy, but if we're looking at Monahan as a number two, I think Zucker could fit very well with Backlund and Mon- and Manjipani. 
and then move Lindholm back to center where he seems to like being. So I think your first line becomes Kachuk, Lindholm, Goudreau, or somebody there. Zucker, Backlund, Monjapani. You keep your third line as Lucic, Bennett, Dubé, and you backfill um, the defense. And that still gives you for that top line right wing enough money to go out and buy somebody and to go out and buy a defenseman. I can see that. You know, like, I, I again, I'm not trying to say one's right or wrong, and I'm not trying to say yours is wrong. It's just two different approaches. Oh, no. And, yeah, and I agree. Yeah, and I could see I, something along what you said happening. Like We we know we know that Trees tried to get Zucker in the past. I think that, uh, again, a great – I mean, when are you going to find – let's say that Goudreau and Monaghan are first-line players. You're not going to find first-line players for less than $7 million these yeah. days. And I think you might be able to get more back for them because of that yeah. if you did want to make a deal. But I think in some ways, almost like some people thought we were losing in the Neil for Lucic, I think that Zucker brings some intangibles and some grit that this team could use. I don't think he's necessarily point for point as good as Monaghan, but I think he brings some things that we yeah, would need. There. and I could see something exactly along the lines that you said. Like, uh, you know, it. this is one of those weird... like. It, it, in years gone by, it's been kind of like these are the expected moves, and like you just wait for the GM to kind of make those expected moves, and like there's not really any unexpected things that happen. This is and even for that top line, right? I could see him go after you know, Hoffman. Um, yeah, like there Foley, are so many different a, ways. There's a few guys there I could see him go after. Yeah. Like, honestly, if it was me, I would be pillaging the Florida Panthers. You know, because they have a, quite yeah, a few well, I'm even good looking players. At just, yeah, UFAs that you could go after. I mean, Mike Hoffman, yeah. uh, Sam Reinhart, uh, Dadnov, like you said, I think Toffoli would be a good fit there. Um, if you want to get a guy who's making less and might break out, a guy like Kevin LeBanc, um, LeBanc, yeah. Um, Nemesnikov, even if they, you know, if they could do that, I think he's going to get re-signed. But like, there's enough right wingers there for the f- top couple lines you could get for a decent price. I think I would almost trade out of center and trade, and then try to fill that right wing with, um, with a free yeah. agent. And I could see something along that line happening. And, and I'm not. I don't want to say necessarily that Hall's a bad choice. It's just not the choice yeah. I would make. I would I would like to see them beef up, spend a little bit more money on the defense, because really, I mean, you look at a guy like Hannafin, he's been around the league for a while, but he's still a very young man, and really the only guy there that has experience is your number one and your, let's call him your number five. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to go in with that, that shallow of – of depth on defense in terms of um, in terms of veterans. I mean, you look again at defensemen that are available. Um, you know, Travis Hamanick. I could see Hamanick or Brody coming back, but not both. Um, but even if you look at you know uh, Zadorov, uh, Trevor Daly, like another Vatnin. guy that could be a five six and at yeah Vatnin and add some veteran. I don't think we're looking for a number one defense like you said. I think yeah we need four to give five six Anderson guy. And, yeah, and I, and I think you want a young guy with Geo, whether that's Hannafin or Anderson, because he always makes anyone he plays with look better. So I think you're really looking for a top four and maybe a, a bottom two. Yeah. And they have the money to do that. I mean, even a guy like Tori Krug, if you could get him for a decent price, I'd look at. Yeah. I think Krug will get overpaid there, but... Um, yeah, so do I. Yeah, I there, think, there's enough guys. I think guys. you're probably looking at Taylor Hall money for Krug. <laughs> Yeah, Sammy Vatnin, I think, could get overpaid. Um, I mean, you could go with sort of the off the board and bring in Kulikov as a as a bottom two guy, not necessarily a guy I'd want, but a guy who's been around for a while. Jonathan Erickson, again, if you're looking for some veteran help, but I think we sort of need to get guys who've been in the playoffs, like a Zucker, more than just a, a Taylor Hall who's a big flashy name. Yeah. And I think we saw success with that in bringing in Lucic. Yeah, I agree. So two different ways, two different ways of building the team. Um, but as always, you guys tell us what what you do. Maybe you'd follow one of our strategies. Maybe you have a different strategy. Let us know where you'd go with it. Anything else about uh, roster changes that need to be made that you want to bring up there? I didn't oh, mean to no. cut you off in your roster. I just um, want to make sure we both got. I think ours. that this year more than so than normal is going to be. 
more unexpected. Like, uh, I could see this team going in about 30 different directions. I feel like you have to move Monaghan or Goudreau for the sake of making a... I hate to say for the sake of making a change, but I think it's at the point where we have to move one. Yeah, uh, and it's one of those things that... It's just hard to figure out exactly, like, without knowing where and what is out there, you know, like, where anything goes. Like, you know, like, there could be a deal for, say, Monaghan that is, like, highway robbery, like the Hamilton trade. And, you know, Mm -hmm. like, in which case you'd be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And that's funny, or fine. And, you know, like, you look at, uh, like, what Lindholm and Hannafin have brought, like, that, you know, losing Hamilton, it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine, fair. And if you look at, like, if you can get a similar impact... I don't think it needs to be highway robbery, but find a trade that's going to benefit both teams. And a lot of teams need a top, top two center. Yeah. Another place I could see Monaghan landing would be the Ducks. As much as I'd hate to see him go there, I think he'd fit in well mm-hmm. there. The question is, what do you get back? They're not going to give you Max Jones. They're not going to give you Silverberg. I don't think uh, Danton Heinen is the guy you want back. So the question would just be, what do you take now, back? Now, I have a question for you. Sure. Would you trade Monaghan or Goudreau for number three and number five? Because I would maybe tra- – you're talking about the number three and, and number five uh, picks in this yes, year's draft. Yes, from Ottawa. Because I know what Tree can do with picks, I probably would. I wouldn't expect him to use both. But if he's got three firsts, imagine what he can turn that into. I wouldn't necessarily trade Monaghan for that necessarily because then you're – I think Monaghan needs to be converted to an asset. I think because you have Kachuk as your number two on the left, I would trade – Goudreau for the pick, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, I think Monaghan has to be turned into a roster asset because we are not as deep as we want to be at center. So you need to get something for giving up the centerman. But, yeah, I think I think Goudreau to, um, to Ottawa would make sense. I believe after this season, Goudreau has a no trade that kicks in as well. So this is the year to yeah. trade him. Now, he, Oh, no, sorry. It, it kicks in after 2020, 2021. Now, here's another question for you. Would you trade Matthew Kachuk for those two picks? No. Are you going to ask me if I, if now we would try to trade for Matthew's brother? Oh no, um, I, I actually would. Which I think you have to ask yourself where this team's at, and if you want this team to be successful and you want them to to challenge for a cup, I think the answer has to be no. Yeah. If you're willing to rebuild, sure. But I yeah. think the way this team is built and the way that Brad talks about this team, Brad Treliving, our GM, they're ready to challenge for a cup. And you're not going to do that if you move on from Kachuk. Yeah. Five years ago, maybe. But I, I think with this roster, and like you've said, we have the right team on paper. Yeah. I don't want to start mortgaging that team. True. So I wouldn't. But like I said, if you move, you know, Goudreau for the the third and the fifth, you trade the third and you pick fifth and wherever we're going to pick, let's call it 20th, um, you know, or you move the third and the fifth and get two other things. Like there's a lot that we we know that Brad could do with yeah. those picks. So I would do that. Yeah. Interesting thought experiment, yeah. though. Well, Matt, should we play the free agent game that we play sure. every year? Sure. We're going to talk about UFAs and RFAs. We'll bring up a name. Uh, we'll do UFAs first, and then we'll decide if we would, if we think that we should keep them, what kind of raise they should get, or if we should let them walk. Right. Uh, UFAs for this year. I think the first one, um, the man who had no contract and was the reason Edmonton failed last year, Tobias Reeder, didn't have a deal go this time last year, had no contract, made the team out of camp, $700,000. I'd bring him back. I'd pay him up to yep. a million. I, I'd even do a two-year deal just because he was so good. And Yeah, if he wants to do up to a million, I'd give him two. I think even a million on your fourth line is yeah, still a good deal. Cheap. I yeah. wouldn't go any higher yeah, that, than a million. That's perfectly acceptable and cheap, and he can slot in higher if need be. He's a good penalty killer, 
great. If he does less than a million, like if he'll do eight fifty, I'd even give him a three year and sign him until he's yep. thirty. Um, Zach Ronaldo, thirty years old, seven hundred thousand. Um, no point. Uh, if he wants to come back, if yeah. AHL if is, the AHL's playing, sure, but yeah. If the AHL's playing, I think he's a good tough guy. We saw some offense from him this year, but I think he's a good guy to have in your system. But I wouldn't bring him back looking for him in an NHL yeah. deal. Um, TJ Brody currently making four point six five million. His first time being a UFA this year. Uh, he currently has a no movement. What kind of deal would you bring Brody back on if you're going to bring I him back? What about uh, Travis Hamonick currently making three point eight five and again a UFA? I wouldn't. At the end of this year, no, no, I don't want. I, I frankly bring, don't want either of them back. I think the Flames need to get I, younger on the defense. I don't want to bring TJ back. I think we've seen enough ups and downs with TJ here that he's not the right guy for what they'd be paying him. I think Hamonic, if he can stay healthy, could work here if they can get him for about the same price, less than four. I think he could still be your third line guy if you need him to. He can, he can bang, he can smash. I think we need that on the. Back I think end. he's gonna be so already get him at, penciled into Winnipeg's lineup next year. <laughs> that's part of the reason I wish we had him signed because I think we could trade him to Winnipeg for something. But um, no, I agree with you. I think he wants to go to Winnipeg. Yeah. Uh, Derek Forbort, one point eight nine three million. Uh, if he's cheaper than that, sure, I guess as the number six, but I wouldn't go out of my way. I don't think that Forbort's going to be cheaper. I think he's done enough in the NHL that you'll probably see him get a deal for. I could see someone signing for two million. Yeah, it, it's one of those where I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go out of my way. Like there's it, enough, there's enough UFA defensemen that if you lose four board, you'll find somebody to fill yeah. that role. Like he's perfectly acceptable, but it, it, I, he's there. It, you know, if the Flames decide to bring him back, it's like, oh, okay, sure. But I, it, it, yeah. Oh, sorry. So we're, we're paying him one point eight nine. Um, LA retains six hundred thousand, so he's making more than two million. So at that point, yeah. I don't want him back. If you can get him for one five and he's got no job, this is not a guy I target first. This is a guy I, circle back around. We'll call it July. We'll call it July first. Probably going to be like November eleventh. But this is a guy that I don't target November eleventh. Once December rolls around, if he still doesn't have a job, you offer him a contract at one four. Yeah. Um, Eric Gustafson, twenty eight years old, one point two million this year. What would you give uh, him for a raise? You wanted to bring I him back? Would up to like one and a half to like 1.8 like i think that he's serviceable enough on the power play it, it basically reminds me of like the modern day anton babchuk just somebody you, you can throw on the power play to that's not the kind of guy you want to resign Matt. Uh, yeah if he's like the depth guy that you can throw out on the power play to score some goals sure why not where is Ant anton babchuk siberia somewhere he last played for Atlanta Moscow Oblast. I love their names yes. over there. We're probably butchering yeah. that, but um, yeah, I I would bring him back. I'd bring him back in no more than one five. I think you've also got to look when you're when you're looking at these salaries at sort of creating a hierarchy. And if he's getting one eight, then what are you gonna have to pay Shillington? What are you gonna have to pay the next guy? And I think you've got to look at that as well. I think for a veteran guy who can play left side or right side. 28 i think i'd give him one five for two mm. years i don't want him here long term i'm not that confident in him but i think one or two years you can't yeah. go wrong um michael stone seven hundred thousand. do you bring him back right away or do you kind of shop around and bring him back if no one else i uh, i think that it's if you know it, yeah it, i think he'd be another training camp tryout guy he's 30 years old i think as a number seven when he came in this year, my thing with him was you can tell he's a guy who's been used to playing regular minutes because when he came in as a fill-in, he often didn't look good. And I think for that kind of role, you need a higher guy who's used to being a number seven who knows how to – like a backup goalie who knows how to play limited minutes. Yeah, and, like, I don't see – like yeah, I just don't see him being – good you know no and that's another that's another one of those positions that you know we could reach into the free agent barrel and pull out nine guys who would play for seven hundred thousand as well 
This was a Brad Treliving signing, and I think this might be the one we sort of mentioned earlier. He doesn't like to retain his guys too much. This might be the one he yeah. does. Sadly. Um, on the on the goalies, we have Riddick for another year, but Talbot's making two two million seven hundred fifty thousand. He's up for renewal. What would you give Talbot? Uh, up to three and a half. I yeah, I wouldn't go out of my way to like it. It would have to make sense um, with uh, Talbot. Like if you, there was an upgrade to be made, I, I would prefer to go in that direction. But Talbot's a definitely a decent secondary if you look at the guys that are available unless you want to spend you know eight nine ten million dollars it's all sort of 1b guys that are available this year now i i mentioned this on another show you and i did we were on the hockey podcast doing a post game wrap up for one of the games not that i'd be necessarily actively looking to move him but at this point if the Flames need a sweetener in a deal or think they can get some for him, I'd be okay moving on from David Riddick. Uh, honestly, like if Riddick comes back or not, like it. Riddick's got next year on his deal, but if there's somebody who's looking for a goalie at 275 and we can move him, I think you could find a guy you can play similar minutes if Talbot's going to be the number one for cheaper. Yeah, like it, as much as it you know sucks because I do like Riddick. Uh, the Flames need to basically keep cycling goalies through until they get, like, the next Kiprasov. And mm. and I don't know there's anyone in our system yet who I'm ready to bring up there in that role. Yeah. But I think that, yeah, you can find someone in free agency to give yeah, a shot to. Yeah, and I think that, like, the Flames just need more stability, period. And, I, you know, Riddick... He's frustrating because at times he looks like he might take those steps, but then he looks horrible after that, and it's he's just too up and down. And so, like, if the Flames could move him in a deal, fine. Um, if not, fine. Like it. Well, let's let's say they do move him for Sun. Here's goalies that are sort of making about the same as him this year. Tell me if you'd want any of these guys. You think they'd be a an upgrade? How does yep. that sound? Anton Hudobin. Sure. Th- 35, though? I don't know if I want two older goalies. Like, I think if you're trying to find the guy, you need to bring in a younger one to hopefully, you know, be able to take over for Talbot when he's done. Yeah, well, it's one of those things that uh, it would be okay. Like, I it, I wouldn't be, like, super gung-ho about it. But, you know, just for an adequate, he could do the job for a year. Yeah, Hudobin could. Would you go back to Elliot or Smith? No. No, 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 no. Uh, what about Linus Allmark? He would be one of the guys that I would actually really like in this organization. I think that he has untapped potential, uh, sort of like Auntie Ranta. I think him. I could see Aaron Dell being a backup. Um, he's only 31. Not necessarily a guy that's going to become the number one, but a, a guy that could. And I could also see them chasing after Mike Condon. Yeah. If they're looking for a goalie. Not that they're going to yeah. chase him, but if they move on from Kipper, I could see Condon filling that. But the only thing I I, li- I agree with you about Allmark, but I think we're not the only ones that see that. And I think his $1.3 million could easily become three or four because some team's going to pay him for potential. Yeah. And after that, I mean, I don't want Malcolm Subban, no. um, Thomas Grease, um, Jimmy Howard is too old, Craig, Craig Anderson's too old, um, Markstrom's going to make bank. Murray's going to make bank. Like those are really the guys. Unless you want to go Laurent Brassois or Louis Domingue, those are really the only other options. Yeah, like honestly, I would be going hard after Elvis Merlitskins from Columbus or somebody like that, where the team has two good goalies that that are young. And but again, I think there's so many teams out there looking for a young goalie. The prices would be really. I high. know, but. The year to do that, I think, would be next year when you're going into an expansion sure. draft. Find a good enough pair this year, and then... I mean, we saw the Flames try to make a, a flurry-like deal. I think that's where you're going to find a team jammed up is going into the expansion sure. draft. Um, so those are our UFAs. The last one is Austin Zarnick. Uh, do you bring no. him back? Yeah, I would agree there. he was kind of disappointing, and... He was in the AHL. I mean, you know, if you need an AHL body, sure, but I'm not looking to bring him back to make the team. Yeah. 
I think that if he gets Let's a shot run. with like a real bottom feeder like Detroit, I think he could still break out, but he needs to go to somewhere where he can get a lot and of And I time. think a good veteran guy for your AHL lineup if the AHL is playing. Yeah. Um, on the RFA side, uh, Jankowski, arbitration eligible, 1.67. Do you, do you uh, try to retain I him? Don't or do you, I, I wouldn't even no, qualify. No, me either. Just let him walk. Andrew Mangiapane, 7.15, arbitration eligible. What do you think Mangiapane well, is in for for a race? He listened to us earlier in the season when he was holding out and said, hey, bet on yourself, man. And he did. And now he's going to make bank. I think he's going to get... What do you think he's in for? Honestly, I'd like the Flames to go four, uh, for 10 total. So two and a half per. Okay, so four years, two and a half million a year. I wouldn't want to go much more than two million or two point five million. I was thinking two million a year, high end. But if we're signing them up long term, I'd be willing to give them the extra half million yeah. a year. Um, what about Shillington? He's making seven seven million seven hundred and thirty thousand this year. I wouldn't go any more than a million for him. I yeah. think he's still an unknown commodity at this point. Yeah, uh, he's progressing slowly. Uh, he's learning how to play defense at a better level. He just needs more time to figure out whether he's a top four defenseman or like a version of Brett Kulak. And, you know, I think a million bucks or less, sure, why not? And I wouldn't go long term. No, I do one like a year. million or less for one or two years, and you can always re sign him yeah, after that. I think it, with him, I think it'll I be just, a one year. Based on what we saw last year. I'm not convinced he's a long-term a guy that we need. Yeah, here. it's one of those like I go one year at a time with anybody who doesn't show like, oh, we should keep you. And uh, you know, yeah. and like Manjapani, yeah, four or five years, lock him up. You know, just like with Rasmus Anderson, but Shillington, it, it's like show me what you got, and just keep showing me until either we move on or, you know we back up the Brinks truck into your driveway. <laughs> no, I can yeah. see that. Well, let's, uh, we're going a little bit long, but we have a lot to wrap up. It's like a debrief, you know, after a CIA mission or something, but, um, we're not the only ones that are frustrated. We have a lot of fans who got a hold of us either through email or Twitter. Um, let's run God, through you, these. You should have see if heard we... my neighbors, my mother, you know, like just, people that know that i do what i do like yeah it was like having everybody vent at me <laughs> ever since well and this is why i'm glad we're doing the show on monday because i needed some time to step away and reflect on the show and reflect on the or not the show reflect on the show the flames put on and reflect on the team and i think i would have had very different thoughts right after that loss. yeah uh, i know yeah I well i think every single flames fan and player was absolutely pissed after that game and deservedly so flames didn't play like they were pissed yeah well that dallas just took advantage of their lack of preparation but you know we'll see yeah let's go to the comments so that way we can sort all this stuff out so we we had a it sounds like we're like dr phil or doing an advice column let's sort out our fans yes um we got an email from a guy named Pietro, uh, or Pietro, sorry for mispronouncing that, and he emailed us and said, there's a lot of talk about tra trading Johnny Goudreau and Monaghan. I personally don't like Monty's game, and am not a fan of JG's ballerina style either. I think they're not, not passionate enough, which shows mostly during the playoffs. They are both forwards with great numbers under reasonable contracts that are about to expire. Trading them now would make sense if the team wants to shake up the roster. I think you and I addressed that, that... Yeah, if you want to if you want to trade them, now's the time. But I think we have to be careful just moving them for the sake of moving them. I think one of them's got to go, but I don't want to just move them and not get good value for them. Um, however, who are we going to get? Another Bennett style player who comes to life during playoffs but has an average regular season. A couple of free agents, especially considering how badly we've chosen free agents recently. He's got a point, especially wingers. I mean, Neil Brower. I don't know if trying to solve those problems through UFA is the right way to go. 
Are we trading JG and SM for picks? You talked about trading one of them for the first round picks. Um, are those picks going to produce enough points to get us to the playoffs? We don't. Why don't we shift the focus on the coaching staff and the GM? Maybe all we need is a good manager who can help improve the attitude of the team. I would personally try to stick with Goudreau and Monaghan for another season and maybe add a solid free agent. Surely clear some cap space, not renewing Brody and Hamannick. So you and I, I think, covered most of those already. Um, I don't necessarily agree that we should shift the focus to the GM, as we talked about. But I think if you're going to move those guys, and I'm not saying the, the coaches will, but I think if you're going to move them, you're going to get the best value for them this year. What yeah, do you think? Yeah, and I think that, like, especially in the flat cap and, like, teams that are closer than the Flames to uh, winning the Cup, I think they're going to be under a lot of pressure to take those next steps and might be willing to sell additional assets just to uh, get, you know, because the, they are both under bargain contracts. So, like, the Flames could they probably are. get, like, an extra first round or more out of, like, the expected return just from the fact that they're, like, uh, get making about $3 million less than what they should be based on their production. I, I think, though, like I said earlier, you've got to... If we're going to move them, you've got to temper your expectations. I don't think these two guys, and Matt, tell me if your thoughts are different. I don't think these two guys are top-line teams on a team that's close to the cup than we are, or top-line players on a team that's close to the cup no, than we are. No, I, I, how would you say? I view them basically as Phil Kessel was when he was with Toronto. Like, just a good player on a team that wasn't quite good enough and yet, if he goes to like a contender like a Pittsburgh, then he can slot in on the second line and just have fun. And I think that um, for Gaudreau and Monahan, I think it's a similar situation where if they're going to an established team, they're, I don't think that they're going to be going in a situation where they're expected to be the guy. I think they're... No, and I guess what I'm getting out of it is you're not going to get the guy back no. from them. You're not going to get Braden Shen for one of them. You're not going to get, you know, somebody's top William Carlson or Max Pacioretty. Like, you're not – there are top-line guys here, but I think they would be valued in a trade as No, and uh, I think that, guys. like, what you you would see is more of, like, the Hamilton trade, where Hamilton was the star guy in that trade. And he was the already established first pairing offensive defenseman, blah, blah, blah. And instead, you got two guys that were up and coming, but not quite there yet and needing an opportunity. And I think that if you're going to trade yeah. Monaghan or Goodrow, you're going to get like their versions of like Lindholm and Hannafin. Where decent young well, guys, I think, but... Yeah, I think Hannafin's a better example Like of a decent young guy that's poised to break out, but hasn't quite yet. And, like, they might not necessarily, necessarily have the space to play those guys because they're blocked by mm -hmm. their star players. And, you know, like, you look at a team like Philadelphia, they have a ton of good players up and down the lineup and organizationally in terms of prospects where... Like, you could get a Nolan Patrick. You could get, you know, uh, Sandheim. If you're willing to eat Gosses Bear's contract, you could get a hell of a lot more for that. You know, and, yeah. you know, like, there's a whole bunch of different permutations that the Flames could do. It just depends on which dance partner you're going with. Yeah, and I think you made a good point there, too, about eating a contract. I mean, we talked about how these guys are a good deal, and you might even be able to get a better deal if you're willing to eat a, a contract. Yeah, well, like, you look at the Flyers, they have about 12 good young players that would be absolutely amazing ads for the Flames if they were both willing to trade a Gaudreau or a Monaghan and eat Goss's Bears contract, which I know they're trying to get out of. Yeah, and that's where and that's where you could fill two needs at once. Really, you could almost, um, you know, get a uh, young forward who could be an upgrade and get a veteran defenseman, for example. Yeah. You know, another team. I'm just flipping around here through uh, lineups. 
not that I necessarily want to do this, but I could also see the Islanders make a play for one of those guys. They se- seem to think that they're doing well this yeah, year. Yeah, well, I think the Islanders secretly are developing themselves into a Stanley Cup contender. And, you know, not really in a flashy manner, but I could see uh, them being on the prowl for some good high-end talent. Yeah, I don't think they're great down the middle, so I could even see doing something like a Monaghan for Everly or Bailey, and that could work out well for yeah. both teams. Yeah, well, I think even then, like, if they were to do prospects, they have quite a number of good guys. But sort of like we are talking about, though, with the, uh, you know, with trading for the three and the five, if we're running for the cup, I don't think you can necessarily, or think yeah. we can. I think we have to be careful. Those have to be, those can't be prospects that aren't in the league. Yeah. They have to be prospects that are already playing at the NHL yeah. level. Or very close, like Dobson or something like that. Even then, I don't know that we have a lot of room for those guys to come up. I think they've got to be able to step in right now or they might get True. lost. Otherwise, you're going to have to sacrifice a Dubé or a, a Mangiapane to get them into the lineup. Yeah. Um, next next thing we got was from um, Mowgli Joe 12 on Twitter. Um, one of our fans in the UK who listens to the show, and he says, time to move Johnny UFA in two years? Question mark. Does he re-sign here? Question mark. Can we afford to find a center for him and a winger for Monty? That, again, the guy's free. He could be a winger for them. Are those pieces already in the organization? So let's break these down. Do you think Johnny re-signs here? Yes. I think if the Flames do decide to keep him, I think that he is a good fit if he's in the right situation here. I think he would be willing to sign if... I think his first preference would be to go back east, but I I don't see him not willing to stay here. I think they would be paying him number two money, and I don't know if he'd want to take the number two money after Kachuk. Yeah. Uh, can we aff- afford to find a center for him and a winger for Monty? Yeah, I, I think, think we could. You know, um, we could. Uh, yeah. Like if you throw uh, switch up the lines a bit, and you threw. Hall or insert name of acquisition there on Monahan's line and through Goudreau with Bennett and Dubé, I think that could be workable where you're spreading the wealth through the lineup without... If you're not willing to move Johnny or Monty, though, you're going to have to find that right wing to play with them or whatever position you want um, through UFA. We don't have enough other assets to go out and trade for a top No, uh, Yeah, the Flames need to keep as many of the picks as they can. And, and like, yes. uh, the Flames are an excellent drafting team. Uh, like, pretty much since Tree came aboard and, like, really took the care of the draft, um, basically on almost every top three-round pick, he's hit the mark except for Tyler Parsons. So, you know, like, it, it's... Well, even Parsons, I would say he didn't hit the mark. Parsons has been hurt and had some other things going on that have stunted his yeah. development. But, like, that's the only one where, like, the guy hasn't either turned into an NHL or, or anything like that, so. Um, the next question here, is that piece, let's say that top-line guy to play with Johnny Amani next year already in the organization? I would say no, I think... Dubé could be that eventually, but I'm not willing to put him at that spot next year. Yeah, and that, like that's where I, like I want we have a bunch of good young players like Manjapane, Dubé, Bennett, um, Kachuk, where I want to see them try to boost their development by having them play with as good of players as possible, and like that's why like I suggested, um, like moving Gaudreau on the line with Bennett and uh, Dubé because, like, I think that both Bennett and Dubé have more and could eventually be top six forwards on this team. And, like, if they're playing with a guy like Gaudreau, it could pull that kind of stuff out of them where, like, if they're playing with Lucic, like, that's a different game. And, uh, like, it, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see if they can. And I think we have to remember that not everybody is cut out to be a top six. And some guys look good for a while. And I'm not, 
I think that playing with Lucic and playing with Bennett might be the top end for one of those two. Like I, I could see that being sort of the the high end for Dubin. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But not every young player has the potential to be a number one if they just play with good players or get a lot of minutes. Um, I don't think they're bad players. I just, you know, even Bennett, right? He was a top pick, and he's really settled in as a second, third line center. Yeah. But he's found his role in the team. Yeah, and I think that... And Backlund, too. Yeah, it, well, like, the thing is, like, with Bennett and Dubé, like... They still have those flashes of more there. And, like, I want to see them get an actual opportunity to possibly have that breakout season where, like, they put up 50, 60 points. And, like, I think that they both have that in them. And it's kind of like Shillington where, you know, like, are you a good NHL or worthy of a long-term contract or are you just, like, the good third-line guy? And I think that, like, the Flames, in order to, to even just move forward in terms of, uh, like, beyond this season, like, what do you actually have in these guys? So, like, if you do move on from Goudreau and Lonahan, like, are Bennett and Dubé somebody that you could throw in the top six and, you know, not be a bottom feeder? And, you know, like, we need to know if that's the case and... The only way to do that is to kind of give them a we shot. We have to know that's the case, but not by doing... Yeah, but not by trial by fire, by saying, hey, we're not going to bring in a right winger. Dylan, you're the guy. Oh, you're not doing well. Well, sorry, it sucks. Like, you got to give them measured chances to show yeah, that. Yeah, and I think, like, that's why the Flames do need another top six forward, so that way they can kind of spread everything through the top nine. Kind of evenly. So, like, that way, like, all three of the lines have something good with them and you know and make it so that like you're not just like concentrating everything in the top six only and you can kind of like make everything more difficult for the opposing team's defense scores because like especially like that third line whichever is the third line you they're going to be playing against guys like Gustafson on the other team or Sakara or, you know, like, any of the mediocre five sixes, and, like, those guys could absolutely feast on uh, that line, or that defense pairing, if the Flames can have that ability to roll, like, three scoring lines. We're getting a little bit off track. Let's oh, keep on this question, just because we got a lot to get through here. Yep. Um, I would say those pieces aren't in the organization for next mm -hmm. year, but... They could be, but we have to wait a few years to find out. His next question is, how long is until Monty's contract is up? Uh, Monahan's done in after 2022, 2023, so we've still got, what, one, two, three seasons after this for him. You can just say yes or no to this or just give a number. Is anyone completely untouchable other than 19 right now, is asked by Mowgli Joe. Honestly, I wouldn't even include 19 in that. If okay. the right deal came along, sure. Uh, but of course, but we say that every show, right? No one's going to say, oh, a good deal came along, yeah. you're not going to take it. But I think what he's maybe getting at is you're not out there actively shopping these guys or that deal is probably so unattainable, nobody's going to make you that offer. True, but... Right? Any player can be moved for anything else, but it's like I was talking to a friend of mine about, well, what if a team moved for Hall? Well, what you'd have to move for Hall, you'd be so poor after that, your team would struggle. Mm -hmm. Right, the deal could be done, but it wouldn't make sense. True. So I think we have to look at it that way. Is I don't think there's a team out there that would give the Flames what they think 19 is worth. True. And want to do that deal, which would make them untouchable. Yeah. Right. I mean, it would probably take your top two, maybe three players. So now you move those guys. Like, it, sorry, I'm going back to the uh, McDavid deal. I said to my buddy, if you wanted to get McDavid out of Edmonton, you'd have to give him your top two, maybe three players. Well, now you've got no top players. So you're not going to make the playoffs. So you're not going to take on McDavid if you're not going to make the playoffs. Like, yeah, it could work, but the deal just doesn't exist. Yeah. It would be like trading Monaghan, Goudreau, and Kachuk. And, yeah, then... Well, that's it. So, like we have so a you're couple right. Of if the right deal comes left, along, but, but if you it. can't quantify what that deal would be, I, I think it's tough for us to say, well, anybody can move for the right price. Of course anybody can move for the right price, but what would what would you have to give up to get rid of him, I guess? 
And we won't get into that now, but I would say, based on my thoughts on that, I'd say you probably couldn't put together the deal it would take to move him out of here. Next question we got was from John Wallace Howells, someone who we've read a few tweets for on the show over the years. Who should the next coach be? I think we talked about that a little bit earlier. Should the new coach keep Johnny and uh, Monty? We've talked about that. He says, I'd have a first line of Goudreau, Lindholm, and Kachuk and have Monty center the second line, which we've talked about. He said, I'd trade Backlund. He's just not good at face-offs. And I don't want to get too far in the weeds here just because we have a lot to get through, but this is something I've brought up a few times lately. If you're looking at Monahan as your second line center, and if you're looking at Bennett as your, as your potentially third line center, well, then you got to put Backlund at, at 3C. And at 5.3, he's an expensive third line center. Like, I think if you can't move Monaghan and you move him to second line, I almost think you've got to move Backlund just to free the cap. You could do that. Uh, if the Flames were wanting to trade Backlund for a similar caliber defenseman, that would be fine. Um, but I'd kind of just prefer you know because he's such a good two-way player that I just kind of prefer to keep him even though he is an expensive third line center I, I honestly I think that the Flames have enough good young guys coming up for the time being that you could roll with him being the third line center making that much and be fine with that and but the only thing about putting him third line center if we sort of leave the makeup the way it was this year is uh, you got Lucic and Dubé there. I don't think Backlund's the guy to center those two. No. You'd have to switch a whole bunch of things up, frankly. And even then, then Derek Ryan sits out, and we're paying Ryan, what, like $3 million to sit out then? Yeah. Like, I think in that case, either Backlund or Ryan has to go. Yeah. Like, honestly, I would sooner trade Derek Ryan. And I like Derek Ryan, but I'd sooner trade him. But I, I don't think you're going to get anything for Derek Ryan. He's going to be a bad contract. The team's going to take him as their number four. I think as much as I don't want to trade Backlund, in that scenario I would because we'd get more value for him. Who do you think – what's somebody going to give you for a $3 million Derek Ryan? Oh, probably like a third or fourth round pick. The for league trade. I don't know. I don't know if they'd even go that high. We'll, we'll see, but – yeah, I mean, I can I can see where he's coming from. We've tried to put Backlund on the wing, and it hasn't worked out. Um, but I, I can – let's say I can see a plausible scenario where Backlund might go. Mm -hmm. um, John also got into here, big questions over Tree Living. He's done well and has built a strong core of D-men, but he's wasted picks in trades. A first on Hamannick, a second on Elliott, Smith, and Lazar. He added bad free agents, Brower and Neal. Our farm is weak, too. So we've sort of addressed this earlier. I don't think the first on Hamannick was a waste. I guess it depends what you're looking at there. We got a guy who is a top four defenseman. I mean, sure, he's not a young stud defenseman, but I think for what we gave up and the player that we gave up to get him that that pick was converted to, I have no problem with that pick. The second for Elliott, if Elliott would have turned out the way we hoped he would, I think that wouldn't have been a bad deal. Look at some of the crap that Daryl Sutter traded seconds for. Um, Smith, same thing. Lazar, I think we all agree he overpaid. What do you think on those deals, the seconds and the first? Uh, at the time, it made sense, but like Kairou would have looked good in a Flames jersey. Uh, but it, but again, it, it was the win now mode. Yeah, right? he exactly. Was to make the deals he needed to win now, and the and Kairou's a couple years out. Yeah, and like From frankly, the Flames, I think. It, now have their starting goalie for the next few years with Talbot. I honestly I would prefer to keep Talbot for two or three seasons just because he's an adequate mm -hmm. starter for you know he, he's just solid and I think that the Flames need just a solid goalie for a while anyway. Um uh, we talked about we talked about Tree earlier, and the way I look at these is he's taking risks. And I would say in most cases, these risks paid off. Yeah, and, like, it also... Show me, it show also me a GM kinda, who's never made a bad yeah, move. Well, it also kind of helps that Treliving has been excellent. Absolutely excellent with the draft. Uh, like, you look in 2015, he only had two second-round picks, a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh. He got Rasmus Anderson, Oliver Shillington, and Andrew Mangiapane in that draft. Like, that's really good. 
Then in 2016, he had uh, a first, two seconds, and a third. Got Kachuk, uh, Dylan Dubé, and Adam Fox in that. And in the sixth round, he also picked up Matthew Phillips, who's looking like a future NHLer. 2017, he got Yusuf Valimaki. Uh, didn't have anything for the until the fourth round, and some of those guys are kind of looking not so good. Um, in 2018, with the sixth and seventh round picks, got Emilio Pedersen and Dmitry Zavgarovny, who both look like they're excellent prospects and could be future NHLers. And last year, getting Jacob Peltier in the first round, he's looking like a future NHLer. So, and Dustin Wolf in the seventh round is looking like a really good goalie prospect. So, like, even though the Flames have been tra uh, trading a lot of draft picks, Frankly, since Treliving has taken over the draft, the Flames have had their best drafting probably since the 1980s. And, which, that's kind of sad, but true, because the Flames drafting has been just that horrible. But, you know, like, the Flames have been able to use their, all of their picks effectively, and I think that that's been a huge countervalence like if we didn't get guys like Manjapane or Wolf or you know like any of the like Dubé or Fox or you know Shillington mm -hmm. Anderson like the Flames would be in a really tough spot and I don't think that they would have made those trades but well I think the difference there I think you're right there's a lot of guys that'll be NHLers but I don't know there's guys that are going to be the number one or the number two forward on this team and I think Sometimes when fans look at it, that's the way they're looking at it. I don't know about John, but, um, you know, I don't know if all those guys are going to be your, your can't-miss Flames prospect, but we have to remember that not everybody can be that, and I think you're right. Trees set us up well for the future, but we're still going to need to either develop internally a guy like a Chuck or pay a free agent to come in and take that role for the next couple of years. Like, of those guys, Matt, who do you think could be, let's say, the one of our top four forwards in the next four or five years? Uh, maybe Peltier. Uh, I think Pedersen too. Okay, so so two. And maybe. Phillips on an out. If he doesn't get absolutely murdered, being like 130 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> I I think from what we've seen from Phillips, he's a bottom six guy. No, again, still very respectable player. Not everybody can be a star, right? You need the the Toby readers. You need the. You know, the guys who fill out that bottom uh, six. I, I actually got a lot I'm, of those. With Phillips, he reminds me a lot of Jake Gensel. It, so, okay. like, I think that, like, if he actually hits in the NHL, I think he might be one of those surprising, like, middle six scorer types. But I don't think you can look at him no. as a surefire oh, oh, of course, guy no. if he like, hits. Uh, of course not. And it's because he's so small that I think that he might have a hard yeah. time. But if he does actually make the NHL on a regular basis, I think he could be that kind of an impact guy. But, again... I would say outside of the draft, the other thing Tree's done really well is he signs really good contracts. Oh, yeah. Like, the Flames are, in in terms of contracts, are probably in one of the best positions uh, in the entire league. You know, I mean, our, our most expensive guy is Kachuk, who's making $7 million. You don't see that on many teams that are contenders. Or one yeah. of the contenders. Um, last one here we'll go through is from Ryan Swanson at 76 Swanson on, uh, I imagine his last name is Swanson, but Ryan at 76 Swanson on Twitter. Uh, we talked about this time to trade Johnny and Monty. I thought this would, uh, I thought they would of this past year get something in return now. So we talked a little bit about that. Uh, look at other teams. They're desperate to shake things up. Can you package something to get a playoff style number one center? I think, like Matt said earlier, you're not going to get somebody's number one center for those guys, but you might get sort of the the younger guy who needs a chance. And I think a Lindholm's a great example of that. He came in from Carolina, and we've given him time and space to develop, and he's become better than he could be. Um, keep Ward as coach, Ryan says. Benny makes me want to keep him just for the playoffs. I don't think Benny's going anywhere anytime soon. This team likes him, and I don't think he's worth moving. Uh, Lucic and Brody were a nice surprise. Geo concerns me in the playoffs. Time to do a drastic tweak to the last two to three of the core players. Anything you want to add to what Ryan has there? I think we covered most of that yeah. already. Um, yeah, we're 
basically on that same yeah same wavelength as most of these guys yeah. i guess um so i guess that pretty much wraps up our season matt anything else kind of closing thoughts on this 20 this weird 2019 2020 nhl oh, season? Uh, the flames will be picking uh 19th overall in the draft um which isn't too bad um there's a what do you think the chance is they move that pick? Zero. Uh, I, th- I think they need to pick take that pick. Uh, there's a number of good players that are available. Um, my preference is uh, Dawson Mercer or uh, Jacob Perot, not Jacob Peltier. Jacob Perot. So yeah, the, the, those would be my two. Uh, we'll we're gonna have, of course have our draft preview show and all that kind of stuff, but uh, yeah, that's. You know, another, you know, two or three episodes sometime in October, I guess. Because that's when we normally prep we'll for see. the draft. I mean, <laughs> yeah, as we as we always say, you know, we'll be back either when there's something important like a draft, an event, or when the Flames do something that makes us have to record again. So, we don't know when the next show will be. We don't even exactly know when the draft is going to be. We don't Just even know when the, sta- we we don't even dra- know when the Stanley episode. Cup is going to get awarded. <laughs> Well, for all we know, it's already in Edmonton. They know it'll be awarded in Edmonton. Yeah, just when, you know. Cause... Technically, though, Matt, we never know when the Stanley Cup's going to be awarded, right? We know w- the last day it could be awarded. Yeah, but... We never know if a season's going to go five or six or seven. Well, plus, you never know with the whole COVID thing that the bubble might need to... Like, there might be delays at some point. You never know. So more than when, the, the question might be if. Yeah pick one what do you think the biggest story between now and draft day is going to be is it going to be the coach is it going to be moving core players is it going to be the flames talking to free agents what do you think that big story between now and then is going to be uh new coach i don't think that the flames make a trade between now and the draft do you think their big trade comes at the draft yeah usually tree if he does his homework at the draft so, I mean, if we say between now and when the Flames pick, usually he makes that trade often before he picks. So, I don't think the coach will – I don't think we'll have a coach by the draft. That's just my, my feeling. I think they're going to want to interview people. I think they're going to want to wait and see how dominoes fall. Um, I think we're going to see a big trade between now and the draft. And it could be on draft day, but I'll include that in there. And the last thing before we sign off today is we just want to remind everybody, as we always do, we're doing our listener survey. Our listener survey is our chance to get some feedback from you. Um, We want to know what you like, what you don't like, what we can change. Maybe you say, hey, you guys spend too much time bashing the Oilers. I don't want to hear as much of that. Uh, Maybe there's something you want us to add to the show. And really, you know, if you have that suggestion, then, you know, boo. Matt's Matt's going to come to your house. You're not really Flames fans, you know, like, come on. Matt will come to your house and stand outside of the megaphone and bash you. Yeah, know, like really, what? As Flames fans, you know, like we we have constant first round disappointments after constant first round disappointments. What else do we have other than making fun of Edmonton being even worse than that? <laughs> making fun of Winnipeg being even worse than that. True, but you know, it's more fun because you know they have mcdavid and dry and should actually be an nhl team um so yeah let us know your feedback we'd love to hear it you can get to our survey we'll tweet and uh post on facebook the links over the next couple weeks as well but the best place to go is to our website firesidechat.ca slash survey again that's firesidechat.ca slash survey it'll take you about 10 minutes You don't have to leave your name. It can be anonymous. But if you do leave your name and email address at the end, uh, we will do what we always do. We have a surprise package of uh, Flame stuff, Fireside Chat stuff. I think last year we gave out a Fireside Chat t-shirt, a couple Flames hats. We had one of the old third jerseys with the script on it that we had in there. So we have a a mystery box of stuff that has some Fireside Chat merch, some old Flames merch from Matt and mine's collections, um, all sorts of stuff in there. And you'll just get a mystery box of stuff. So... We'll try to post a picture teasing some of the stuff that's in there, but not everything, and, and it's always a surprise for people. So give us your name. That way we can get a hold of you if you win. Otherwise, give us your anonymous feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And as Matt said, we'll be we'll be back when there's Flames news, whether that's October for the draft or two weeks from now if the Flames make a trade. I don't even know if they're allowed to make trades. It's so confusing right now. But um, 
we'll talk to you guys when there's Flames news. Matt, can you still cheer for this team even though there's nothing to cheer for? Oh, of course. You know, the flame never dies. You know, you just have to wait and be curious to see exactly what this team does. I guess when I said nothing to cheer for, like they're not playing, they're on the golf course. You're going to go flames, go. Hole in one. Yeah, I have to dig in my garden. So, you know. When, when you said the flame never dies, you're going to be that crazy old man who's rocker one day when the team has moved out of here. Like, the flame's still alive in my heart. <laughs> they haven't been in the city for 60 years. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. So, well, do you want to take us out as always, man? Well, as always, go flames, go. And kick ass at the draft. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson. Co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.